Let's talk about definitions. The term learning organisation has been banded around with enthusiasm since Peter Senge's um, seminal book in the 90s, The Fifth Discipline. In it, Senge rather romantically ca um, characterised learning organisations as places where people can continually expand their capacity to create the results they truly desire, where new and expansive patterns and thinking are nurtured, collective aspiration is set free, and people are continually, continually learning how to learn together. Back in the real world of governance, structures, and accountabilities, <coughs> Uh, and accountability mechanisms, there remained ambiguity about what that actually meant for business. How does it operate? What does it do? And what does one look like when it's working? David Garvin uh, recognised this and tried to um, define more concretely what we mean by learning organisations as one that was skilled at creating, acquiring and transferring knowledge and modifying its behaviour to reflect new knowledge and insight. The key components of this definition, of course, are that there's an active management of the knowledge process and, subsequent, and that subsequent learning translates into new ways of operating. Oops. Uh, consequential organisational trans, uh, transformation is then a really important part of what it means to be a learning organisation, which is perhaps why universities, uh, skilled as they are, are, creating, acquiring and transferring knowledge, would not, I think it's possibly safe to say amongst friends, be routinely characterised as learning organisations. It is more than just recruiting smart people and then allowing them to get on and do smart things. Senge, as I'm sure you know, created, uh, talked about five disciplines that underpinned the practice, underpinned practice in learning organisations. Personal mastery, which is the personal ownership of and motivation to clarify, reflect on and learn from life. Mental models and a recognition of the impact of internal assumptions and biases have on our ability to balance advocacy and curiosity. A shared vision and fostering a genuine commitment to a shared picture of the future, uh, rather than forcing compliance with such uh, in a, from a top-down view. Team learning and the ability to enter into genuine thinking together, allowing the whole to be greater than the sum of the parts. And at the antithesis of that, I'm sure we've all sat in meetings where the collective IQ of the group is much lower than the individual IQ of the, mem IQ of the members. And finally, systems thinking, which characterises the ability to see the individual and the organisation in the context of the system as a whole, recognition that today's problems are the result of yesterday's solutions, and to see the ability to pull the least obvious levers in order to make progress on issues. It recognises implicitly, implicitly the complexity of the challenges we face. Organisational structures, traditions, are just suggestions for the system thinker. It's about reaching beyond these boundaries. It's about thinking about issues in novel ways and from different perspectives. And it's about seeing the problem for what it is, which is a symptom of the system, and about working to understand how we can intervene to create a different outcome. So returning to practical Garvin, he <coughs> augmented his definition by suggesting several building blocks of activity to give form of the work of a learning organisation. Garvin noted that organisations were good at learning, that, that were good at learning, were particularly proficient at systematic problem solving, which includes using scientific tools uh, to move past a reliance on gut feel, bias and assumptions to make decisions, and about organisations routinely asking, how do we know this is true? Experimentation, which is the systematic searching for and testing for new knowledge. It relies on a steady flow of new ideas, an appetite and incentive for calculated risk taking. And at its heart, a recognition that failure is part and parcel of the learning process. Learning from the past, which is again to lord, the, uh, the, uh, lord productive failure, um, although the extent to which formal and informal organisation or reward systems recognise this, of course, is debatable, meaning what we actually learn from past failures might not be what we should or we could learn. Learning from others, which is to ensure a steady flow of new ideas into the organisation through borrowing ideas from other industries, listening sincerely rather than defensively to our customers, uh, and engaging in study tours and sabbaticals. And transferring knowledge, which is the mechanism by which knowledge is shared. Now, most organisations have much better communication mechanisms than we believe. You just have to start a salacious rumour and to see how long it takes to come back to you. Which is to say that the transfer of knowledge is not and should not always be formal, but it needs to be conscious and it needs to be managed. 
Recognising and leveraging our informal knowledge brokers is certainly part of our leadership work. So Senge's disciplines are personal disciplines insofar as they relate to how individuals interact and learn from each other. Garvin's activities are organisational insofar as they describe the actions that must be encouraged, managed and rewarded in our organisations. 